Well, Colin, it's uh, good to meet you in the flesh, even though you are 3,000 miles away. Nice to meet you, Danny. <laughs> Pleasure. Good man. Good man. I uh, first came across your book, The Fighting Irish of New York. I think it was reviewed in the Irish Times last year. And then I started to follow you on Twitter. And it was only then that I discovered, and I can't understand how this went under my radar, that you had published uh, two memoirs, one in 2011, I think 2011. Uh, but anyway, you, you've, you published you published Orangutan, which was about your later life, uh, up to date. And then you went back and published the, the memoir, uh, That's That, which was mm-hmm. a little bit strange about the way you went about it. But I just wanted to talk to you about a number of, of things that arise from uh, both memoirs. And of course, you've a, a novel coming out, I think, later this year. And uh, I want to talk about your, you know, when you thought you would become a writer, how you became a writer, uh, your alcoholism, your political beliefs, your family upbringing in, in County Throne. Of course, we have a lot in common. We know only when we were in correspondence that we realized we, we knew so many uh, people around Alton Muskin and uh, Carmen, etc. And I, I knew your Uncle PJ McLean, who was you did. Of the men, who was who was tortured in uh, nineteen seventy one when the tournament was introduced. So tell me first of all about uh, your life growing up. Uh, I, I think you're still suffering under the stigma that you happen to be biologically born in Birmingham and you got dragged <laughs> to a school. So tell me tell me about your your upbringing, your background, okay. and uh, your pretty wild background. I, I, I should say. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about the books as we go along. Okay. Uh, you, you, you mentioned both books, uh, Orangutan and uh, That's That, the two memoirs and the, the strange notion that my life in, I wrote about my life in um, America before I wrote about my childhood. And the reason for that was in Thirteen years ago, I had reached a bottom here. Uh, I had been working construction, drinking heavily, uh, and, and I. Uh, Two thousand six, I weighed about one hundred and fifteen pounds, and I was begging dollar bills in Times Square for vodka and drugs. And I wound up. A friend took me upstate to dry out in his farmhouse. Everybody thought I was going to die and uh, I thought I was going to die myself, but I couldn't get stopped. And the day I arrived at the farmhouse to start drying out, I got a notebook out and I started writing. I I think it was as a way of sort of trying to figure out what had happened to me since I got off the boat 20 years earlier in New York and uh, figure out who I was and how, how I had gotten here. And the, the book that ensued that I wrote over the next year uh, was called, I called it Orangutan, and uh, it was published by Random House. And it details 20 years of drinking and madness in America, I guess, while trying to formulate a life as a writer uh, unsuccessfully. But the book was picked up and published nationally and, and, and was doing quite well. And then I wanted to write a memoir about, I don't know, I wanted to write a book about going home to Ireland. Uh, and I give my agent a couple of different suggestions. And she just kept saying, no, you have to write about your childhood. And I said, no. And uh, she said to me, you can't write a book like Orangutan with so much madness, so much uh, alcoholism, addiction, all that stuff. You can't give a book like that to an American audience without saying why. And it was the first time that I sort of stopped and took pause and was like, okay, I, I hadn't really considered that there was a why that, that it was actually trauma that I was dealing with. And what, what I did then was I went back and started writing about my childhood and uh, Random House then bought that book as well. That's that about growing up in Northern Ireland. So I started where I was and moved backwards through my life, dealing with it over a six year period. And you certainly, you certainly, I mean, 
doing it in reverse order was a bit strange. Uh, yes. The fact that the, the, the first book, uh, Orangutan, is uh, you know, published when you're a mature writer. Uh, and the, the, the other book, That's That. The two, the two, what struck me about it is, is that uh, the tone in them is, is, is completely different. I mean, in, in Orangutan, you know, the beast that comes out in you, the madness that comes out in you, the fury that comes out in you, you know, you can see, for example, Bukowski and influence there uh, totally. in the writing. But, and then after that, you then go and write uh, That's That, which is quite a tender book, a uh, searingly honest book, uh, at times uncomfortable to read. Uh, I mean, you, you, you become an alcoholic basically at the age of 15. Uh, you, when you originally moved over from England, you know, we lived in a council house. Your father built his own house. You moved into it before it was finished. You, you grew up at a time of corporal punishment. What I found also fascinating, uh, being from Belfast, is the, the arguments around the table. You're, you're born into a state where the trouble has started. And you have an uncle who's been, been arrested, but not necessarily a great political influence on you. But tell us about what it was like. You know, you, you talk about your humiliation, seeing your father stopped by the by the army. Uh, tell us what what you know what that was like around your your family home. Where do you, do you locate this trauma? Is it internal to you? Were you born with it, or do you think it came as a result of experience? I I think it, it, it's it's both. Number one, uh, I, I read a book because what happened then during the writing of that that I had like a mental breakdown. I was sober. I've been sober now for 13 years and uh, I had wound up going to jail. I drank again. While I was writing Orangutan, I slipped. I wound up going to jail for a couple of months upstate. I got out and a few months later, I sobered up and I've been sober for 13 years. When I wrote that, that and I started confronting my childhood, I realized I'd been running from even looking at it. So what I did was basically I went in and started opening old sores. And what I realized was, number one, there was a lot of trauma that I hadn't dealt with. Number two, there was a lot of confusion because I hadn't really fully comprehended the fact that I'd grown up in a war zone, that that was real. Even when I wrote the book, I had family members joking, oh, there must have been, there must have been a war going on around Alta Muskin that we didn't see. because. It, because, and because I lived 3,000 miles away, my perspective of it was that I was able to see Northern Ireland as a whole and the experience that we grew up in. And yes, people, when you're there, people are like, oh, this is the whole world. And really, it's tiny. It's like 50 miles by 50 miles. It's not a big area. And when you're outside of it, you realize, oh, there was a, there was a war where 3,000 people were killed over the course of 25, 30 years. And so looking at that and realizing and accepting that I'd grown up in a war zone was number one. Number two, the fact that I had been so close to some very traumatic events, for instance, the, the Loch Gall Massacre, where you I saw those the lads, boys, you knew, you knew some probably. of those lads. Yeah. I, 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 at the time, I was squatting in London you know, with the brothers of those lads and going back and forward from, from home to, uh, to Northern Ireland and wound up going to, uh, you know, it's funny. That day has always been so hazy to me. I went to three wakes, but for the life of me, I can only remember being in two of the houses and, you know, going in and the coffin being open and seeing their faces, you know, shot in the face and stuff like that. Uh, but, when I wrote the book, or when I was writing the book, I had a breakdown, and I actually demanded that uh, Random House give me the book back. I said, I'm not doing it. I'm, I'm, I'm freaked out. And that was the moment I realized that I had an editor at Random House call me one day and say, you're having a, a reaction to trauma. She said, we're asking you to go into a room and open old wounds with a knife. We understand. Take it easy on yourself. Get help and get through this. And that was when I realized that I hadn't dealt with the emotional impact 
of what had happened. On top of that, because you ask, was it because I was there and traumatized? The other part of it that I realized much later, I read a book called The Drama of the Gifted Child. And sometimes you have a child who's born into a house who is sensitive in nature and perhaps an artist in nature. And because they're growing up in a house that has no idea about what to do or how to handle a creative child that needs perhaps uh, some creative input, here's a book to read or here, do this art, and who's been treated like other children, then winds up being very confused with their own identity throughout well, the entire childhood. But at that stage, uh, rather than being creative, you were absolutely destructive. Uh, Completely. Like, I mean, a car driving around those country roads, crashing into a tractor, almost killed. Uh, I don't want to reveal too much way, but I mean, I mean, you're very, very honest in the book. <laughs> There's the, the puppy scene, which I'll not go into. Oh. Which, which, you know, which, I mean, for a child, when I did uh, when I did the book launch at Barnes and Noble, uh, the actor Josh Brolin uh, was there with me in Manhattan to introduce me, and I asked him to read f during the thing. He did. He, he said, I, "I wouldn't mind doing a reading for you," and I had him read the puppy scene. Oh, oh, we'll not we'll, we'll not we'll not reveal exactly what happened there, but it no. was. Uh, it's a difficult uh, read. Uh, you know, it's so funny, you, though. This is what I'm talking yourself. about. You talk about that, and I talk about that as, and looking back in retrospect, the horror of that stuff, when you take it out of the context of where we were at and the life we were living. But you know, and I know, that was everyday life growing up in another Ireland incident, at that time. Another incident in the book, is you're really, really in love with a slightly older girl or woman. I think you're 15 or 16 at the time. And your mother won't let you go to the disco. Mm -hmm. And you're really, really bitter. But you don't want to admit that you're a kept-at-home boy. You know, so you break up with her. And yes. you write uh, about your family relationships, your father and your mother. Uh, I don't know whether you ever read a book by Polly Devlin from the other side of Tyrone. She's from the Moortown uh, Battery area. She wrote a book called uh, All, All Three of Us, Barry Devlin's sister. And again, it's a very, uh. very open uh, memoir which causes, caused a lot of pain. And when your book was published, how yes. did your mother and father feel about it? <laughs> yeah. It was, you know, it's funny, uh, three months before the book came out, I called my parents and I said, that's that is my new book. It's going to be, and they had read my book of Orangutan. They knew how crazy my life was and how honest I was being in my writing. And then I told them three months before, and I said, we need to have a chat because the book is going to come out and you're in it. Our family is in it our community is in it and it's going to be difficult for you. And I just want to say, here are the things that I think you will be upset about. And I told yeah, them... Page, page one to page 325. <laughs> What's really funny, Danny, is I would say to my mother during the writing of the book, she'd say, what are you writing about? And I'd say, I'm writing a book about you. And she would laugh. And I would say, really, am I'm writing a book about you. And it really is about a son and his mother. That relationship is very and, predominant. And she, in the end, she saves your life. She saves right. my life. Right. And, but but uh, the, when, when it came out, there, were, there was a backlash in our area. And I'll never forget the Belfast Telegraph. A lot of people stopped speaking to me for some time. Family didn't know quite how to deal with it. Friends and neighbors didn't know quite how to deal with it. Uh, and it was, it, was, it was a very vulnerable position to be in because I was so raw. And I didn't want to upset people. What I wanted to do is move the conversation forward a little bit into a more honest place where I was saying, hey, it's, we should really talk about the emotional impact of some of this stuff because 
there was a war that happened here in Tyrone. You know, Belfast lost X amount of people during the Troubles. Derry lost X amount of people. And those are the two places you hear about. But outside of that and right on the tail end of that was Tyrone. Tyrone is the next place, specifically where I grew up, is the next area where you see the biggest number of lives lost. And that had never been addressed, I felt. And the Belfast Telegraph then uh, very generously gave me a full page of press and called locals denouncing the book and give it a, he and give it a headline. What was it? Uh, oh, my God. Uh, local author spins tale or basically... I mean, I, amazingly, I didn't even see this because, as I say to you, I've only come across uh, both memoirs uh, this year and I, I just think it's incredible. He's so right in the, uh, the, you know, here, here's the headline. The truth is, it's a load of fiction. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's quite obvious. It's quite obvious that it's a load of emotional, powerful truth. Uh, Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Uh, and and it's, it's, a, it's a brilliant piece of writing. I mean, I, I, I was just glued to both books. I, I think it's one of the best uh, Irish memoirs I've read in a long, long time. Uh, I have to say, did, what, did the Ulster Herald, what did the Ulster Herald say about it? It's funny, the Ulster Herald, uh, one of my favourite titles ever was when uh, I was living in Prague and I came back home to Ireland, I hadn't been home in a long time, and the Ulster, uh, my first memoir had just come out, Orangutan, uh, or was coming out, and they put me on the front page of the Ulster Herald just as I was coming home, and the title was... Uh, Stabbed, beaten, and left for dead. <laughs> <laughs> so well, at least it didn't say. At least it didn't say. Get a lynch mod. Lynch mod. Very <laughs> adult in the muscular six meg crosser barrel. When you see this man's car coming, that's my left. favorite front page mention ever. Uh, and, and I and I would I would wherever I went, I would have people. You know, I might be online at uh, ASDA and the garden. You're the boy who was on the front of the paper <laughs> but um i think part of what i try to do is everybody still talking to you very much you know it's here's here's the funny part uh it there was i think because i do think the book helped heal somewhat in the area i think it moved the conversation into a place where it was uncomfortable where like okay it's all right let's say that this happened and now I feel very much embraced by my community. My relationship with my family and my parents is amazing. We have a very open, honest relationship because we were able to have some very frank conversations because, you know, at the back of it all, it's my own trauma and uh, confusion about my own identity that I was dealing with, but not just my own identity, uh, uh, also my national identity which I had never really understood because, as you know, I grew up in the north of Ireland, you know, being taught with a curriculum designed entirely by the oppressor and and being force-fed, you know, stories about Neville Chamberlain and, and Winston Churchill and never understood or heard one word, not one word, about 1916. Didn't never heard the name Sean McDermott or you know or a Tyrone man Thomas Clark, first name a Tyrone man on the first name on the proclamation, and and that man's not mentioned in my local school in Tyrone. That is an absolute disgrace. To for me, for me to go back and start looking at my childhood and realize that not only was my confusion about my identity grounded in the fact that that I didn't know who we were because there was so much secrecy in Northern Ireland and emotions were not being talked about and the idea of being vulnerable in a conversation was not uh, something people did. But then to understand during the writing of the book when I looked at the Troubles, I did my own research. I did my own history at Delve and then was like, oh my God, like what didn't I know? And then suddenly realizing that we had been denied our own history and how the hell would you know who you were as a person if your history has been denied? I think that's the greatest crime 
that has been uh, perpetuated in the north, and it's still happening to this day. It's still happening. That well, it's happening, uh, especially in terms of media coverage, media presentation. Absolutely. You know, the, violence, the, violence, the, violence, the violence begins when the IRA fires its first shot. So let's ignore all that happened before that. You know, Ex the context lies. The context. Uh, and now that there's no shots been fired, let's ignore the fact that we have a media and an establishment in Ireland, north and south, that serves to uh, perpetuate uh, an environment that is beneficial for that establishment and not for the working class Irish people. And they are very much about not upsetting our English neighbours yes. to the east. It's like, let's not say anything that would upset the English, which is nonsense. It is imperative that we let them be upset as we talk about 1916 and talk about the fact that we lost half the population of the country in an act of genocide that that it that it is and, and you see in my book i use the word genocide mm -hmm. when i talk when you, about the famine well, you, you I mean you carry your politics uh with you when you go to uh america i mean you're, you hang out with mostly Irish lads that is a there's a real culture there a subculture there you know which is uh i mean it's quite dark in a way uh, people who, who die, people who uh, you know constantly drunk on the job. Uh, I, had, I had a friend died. I had a friend friend died Sunday. A uh, young young man that I drank with. Uh, another man. Another man I drank with in my local bar. Irish lad died just on, on Sunday. And then your fellow member of the city. There's a death of a of a friend as well. Uh, features, but uh, I mean, I, I, I as I say, I've read a lot of books. I mean, John Cheever on drinking and. Uh, Evelyn Waugh, uh, uh, you know, Brendan Behan, uh, and this, the book Orangutan Khan is just punching you, punching you, punching you, and every time you, <laughs> you know, you just can't see, I mean, I, 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 unbelievable amounts, you were three quarters distillery, a quarter human, you know, <laughs> most of the time, and I, I don't know how, how, how you survived it, the prodigious drinking that was done, cocaine, taking e-tablets, you know, uh, and also, of course, I mean, there's very funny parts of the course, you're a bit of a serial husband, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you see a woman coming out of, you see a, woman, a young woman coming out of his shop after you open your second-hand bookstore, and you tell somebody, I love her, I'm going to marry her, and of course, you know, it's madness. Uh, 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 the, well, I think... You know, one of the things that I was able to come to terms with when I sobered up was that my drinking life also did not look like everybody else's drinking life. I had gone insane. I had lost my mind. So the relationships and the, the marriages and the divorces and the car wrecks and the jails, it wasn't like every Irish guy who was drinking was... I would look around at the nutters that I was drinking with and think, how are, how are they not in jail? Or how are they not getting into this much trouble? It wasn't so much real. later I realized I, I was the nutter. I was crazy. And the you fact that... Crazy. that you weren't that crazy because I'll tell you something, what I noticed about Tyrone people, and I spent four years there, regardless of what people, the slag and the Tyrone people get, they're one of the most industrial Industrious totally. people that I know. Totally. And you managed. You always had money. You, you know, right you until the end, to. you had an apartment, you had a car. Amazing. Know, yeah, I know. It blew thousands of dollars here, there, and everywhere. You, either your first wife or your second wife cleared you out of everything. The everything. The bank accounts. Everything. I owned a two family house in Riverdale when I was 31 years of age. Driving an SUV, had the black lab, wasn't working, open to use bookstore, coffee shop, had it all. I remember stopping at a light one day in Riverdale and a, a, an accountant I know was standing there at the light and he came up to the window and he just tapped the window and he said, he said, you're living the dream. He says, you're living the American dream. And, and I drove away, the light changed, I drove away. And I remember thinking, oh my God, I... I am. And it made me so sad because I realized I was living this enviable life and I was exactly. still at that stage completely trapped in here. 
none of it made any difference. Yeah, you were into. I mean, it didn't also, matter. I mean, I mean, writing, as of course, I I think has been your your savior in many ways. It um, saved my life. Saved my life. You yes, set up a, totally. a theater company. You perform the players. Very funny scene. Whenever you actually act, and you know, I think you're standing for somebody, and you're called upon. You go on stage. You can't, <laughs> you, you can't open your mouth. Your stage stuff. And then the first lines come to you, and 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 and, and it takes off. And also, interestingly, among some of the personalities you met, you end up babysitting Saoirse Ronan. Uh, her father acts in one of your plays. Saoirse Ronan. When I was in my twenties, I had sobered up. I was. I got first sober when I was twenty-three, and I was eight years without a drink. From reading the book, you'll know that I wasn't really sober. I had an accident when I was 24. I was hit by a car, broke my back in two places and wound up on a body brace for a year and wound up becoming addicted to painkillers, which at that time there wasn't a lot of talk about. But I wound up having, you know, I was sober. Vicodin, Percocet, whatever, you know, opiates. It's basically heroin in a pill form. And what happens is, you know during that period is i become very uh, sort of productive because i'm not drinking but i was also an opium addict and wound up with three doctors on the go but during that time i put myself through college i studied with uh, billy collins who became poet laureate he became my mentor i uh, studied with him for 4 years studied poetry uh we're still very very good friends uh, he considers me his protege, and we we, we joke about it. Um, but I also started going to the theater. Uh, Jimmy Smallhorn and Chris O'Neill, who used to be on the Reardons, formed a theater company in the Bronx. And Paul Ronan, uh, Chris O'Neill met him as an as a he was his bartender. Paul was not acting, and Chris okay. O'Neill says, "You got to come up and be in this play." And uh, he came up and he got the lead role in the play, having no experience. He was just a natural actor. And him and his wife, uh, Monica, used to come to the theater and they had a little baby uh, girl, Saoirse. And they would come over and just plop her down in the seat and like, somebody watch Saoirse while, you know, we'd be over there night after night while they'd be training. It was just an amazing, amazing time and amazing to see Saoirse go on. You know, I'm still in touch with Paul and uh, Monica both uh, to this day, but uh, amazing to see they're they're wonderful people, and uh, it was amazing to see Saoirse then take up the baton and and, and become who she is. Just incredible. Uh, Paul was actually a great actor, also, and was in uh, he was in the Devil's Own with Harrison Ford and Brad Pitt. Uh, yeah, he did. One a, best, he did one of the best films ever made. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 he was in it. That was a huge movie at the time, yeah. and and did well here in in the states. He was also in a Kenneth Branagh play. This was all within the space of a year. In so he had this talent where it was from being a bartender. He was the lead actor in a play. He was showing up and you think about that today. The fact that he was Brad Pitt's sidekick in a movie six months after walking out from behind a bar is insane. That was. I take all, I take all that back. <laughs> <laughs> Not, but that's a natural, natural, God-given talent. He yes. really, he really was very talented and was becoming recognized. So the fact that Saoirse then, uh, it's it sort of, she took up the mantle and she became this actor doesn't surprise me that much uh, they were a talented family to begin with and uh, and good people which goes a long way in the in the business it's just being so a nice I, guy I, I mean there's some great I mean some fantastic scenes in the orangutan uh, for how you got the name for example uh, with the, the meter drag I, queen who I was drinking I was drinking with a drag queen in uh, the tenderloin in San Francisco in in, in, in I had taken her for a drink. She was wearing a, a tiara. <laughs> she thought she was the Queen of England. She was telling me she was the Queen of England. And I, I was completely and utterly taken by this conversation. I told, told her that I completely identified that I am an orangutan trapped inside the body of a man. And that really, 
what I really wanted to do is act like an orangutan in public, but I was trapped in this body. You meant that. You meant that. I, me- I meant it 100. And that's why it's funny was because it's true. I meant it. I meant it. I still feel, I still feel that uh, it's funny because I know that that part of me existed and the beautiful part about the books is, is that I do not have that orangutan anymore. The madness. Uh, I thought you almost a suicide as well. I mean, you were hanging, hanging from a, a fire uh, all, with one hand. Almost, yes. Definitely considered it. Uh, and, uh, and somehow miraculously didn't, didn't go over. It wasn't the only time that what, looking back that I'm able to recognize that there was some other force keeping me alive. Uh, one of the, one of the crazy things about being me is I look back at a life where it almost seems like I'm on the outside looking back at somebody else because the orangutan is so people, people to this day, that book goes on and on and on. People write to me about that book from all over the world and people who have problems reach out to me and say, I read this book. I get messages once a week. Somebody randomly will message me about uh, having read the book or their own problems. And uh, it, it astounds me that I was that guy, as much as it astounds other people who meet me now in my life and see me walking down the street with three young kids and uh, you know, driving a Subaru and uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that, but, yeah, we're, we're, wearing, uh, wearing shirts with uh, Hulu dancers. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, before I finally we go on to the, what you're working on in your next book, I'd just like to say the end of Orangutan surprised me. Uh, and I'm not, I mean, that's not going to spoil it because it's not a novel, but you're still with us. Uh, at the end of it, you have no regrets about being that person, uh, which, which, which in a sense contradicts many of the things well, that are well, said. And, and, you know, you, 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 uh, there's that still rebellious streak in you. So, so let, let that. me address that because that came up quite a bit. And I've thought a lot about that over the last few years. I do have regrets. It was an arrogant thing to say at the time because, but, but it was how I felt. It was how I felt. I tried to be honest about, I'm, all, I'm big on feelings. So at the time when I wrote the book, I really was in a place where I don't give a shit what you think. I even wrote it at the beginning of the book. You like it, you like it, I don't care if you don't. It's right at the beginning of the book. And it. I think now, looking back, it was a way of protecting myself emotionally because I wrote That's That after that book. Mm-hmm. I was not in touch with my emotions when I wrote Orangutan to the, point, to, to the degree I was after I finished That's That and went through therapy and was sober for five or six years at that time. Uh, I wrote Orangutan out of the mat, literally out of the madness of my addiction. I was writing. I was still going through the DTs, hallucinating, oh, I mean, breathless, sweating breathless. while I was writing yeah. that yeah. book. So, so the second book deals more uh, in an honest way about my emotional trauma and all that stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm actually uh, thinking about writing another memoir to cap that, those two because. I've never written one single word about uh, being sober, what it took to get sober, the trauma of revisiting my childhood, the idea that now in retrospect, I can look back and go, I was a child who was traumatized, who went through all this madness and came out the other side with, you know, by pure luck or the grace of God or some you know, miracle that I survived all this madness Although one, emotion, what about, emotionally intact, which what is about, insane. What about sobriety? Might be like a misery memoir. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, this is the thing. I, conflict, I, conflict, drives, conflict drives fiction and drives stories, drives narrative. Yeah, but also good writing. <laughs> <laughs> well, can I say, can I say that so, you are, you are, not just a good writer, you are a great writer with Thank amazing you, potential for the future. The excitement 
when the girlfriend buys you the tape later, it's palpable. <laughs> and yet it's expressed so simply. It, 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 there are beautiful writings in, in both books. So tell us about, you say that in, 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 in one of the books that you wrote a novel in three weeks, right? Which worries me a wee bit because The Bridges of Madison County took four weeks to write. That mm. awful book. <laughs> Don't worry, you remember, remember the, the film was Page great. Page Turner, but, though. I read it too. Page Turner. <laughs> <laughs> I read it in an hour. But, uh, so, I read it in a day. You see? Is, but you read it, you see? Is the, uh, is the novel that novel or is it a different novel? Castle Chapel or something? Like that. Uh, Church End. Church End, yeah. Church End, I wrote uh, in, a ser- in a matter of weeks, yes. Uh, when we were locked down in quarantine uh, five, six months ago here, five months ago, whatever it was, we had just moved. Uh, I now live down in New Jersey, down near the water on the shore. And we just had a baby boy. So we had another baby boy. We have three kids now. Uh, Erica, my 11-year-old, Samuel, who is four, and Bruce, who is five months old. And in moving, I found a manuscript that I'd written in my 20s, a novel. I took it out and realized the only copy that exists of this book is this dusty manuscript. And I started reading it and I thought, wow, this is not bad. So I decided I better make a copy of it. So I started typing the novel to have a, you know, another copy. Of it. But of course, now, 20 years later, taking this first novel that I wrote out of the drawer, I can't just copy it exactly i'm Correct. rewriting it as as i because i'm because i'm a writer i have to i have now what i did do is try to stay very true to the original but obviously you can't as a writer type it up without giving it a polish it's not possible so yes i wrote the first draft but even then i wrote a first draft I did another two drafts of the book back then. So, you know, now I'm giving myself away. If the book is terrible, I have nobody, nobody to blame. <laughs> <laughs> the book will be great. When is it, when is it going to be myself. published, Carl? Uh, it's, I was actually talking to the editor yesterday, and we sh- it's probably going to be in print in a month. Uh, oh. it, and, you know, for anybody who's watching or listening to this, you know, you could obviously follow me on Twitter or Instagram, but also I have a website, www.colinbroderick.com, and I'll have information there about the purchase of the book, and you, you can go there to actually get the links to watch my movie, uh, Emerald City, which is on YouTube at the moment, uh, or find out about the other books. But uh, I got excited about it, and I, I rewrote it, but that that's one thing that I'm doing. The other thing that I'm doing is uh, I, I wrote, I've been writing a script about the Catalpa rescue the, oh, yeah. for 20 years. And I'm now, that's my next movie. So I finished a movie. I just finished a movie uh, that I shot in Tyrone uh, last year. We had just sold out the premiere at the Belfast Film Festival. When the Corona struck. The next day, they cancelled. We had sold out a 400-seat theater in a matter of a week, and then the next day, they cancelled the thing. So that that movie just went to Abandon the River with John Connors and uh, John Duddy and uh, Kathy Kira Clark of Derry Girls. Uh, we shot that in Tyrone last year, and now that's gone. As of yesterday, the sales agent has that, and she's going out to the distributors to see if we can... Uh, shifted along uh, my next feature movie will be the catalpa which yes. i'm doing with a production company called magnifico here and uh it's but but it's a huge movie it's a hundred million dollar movie <laughs> wow <laughs> so i have so so i have to you know it's 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 going to be there's probably a year getting a cast and crew and developing to see if we can pull the money together with the actors, but we've started talking to some actors about the project. And that's been like my dream. My life's dream was to make, you know, from when I first heard the story when I was 31 years of age, my local bar that I was drinking in, the dive bar I was drinking in in the Bronx across from the graveyard was called the Catalpa. 
And I was in there on a Tuesday morning, one sunny Tuesday morning in there drinking. And I said to the bartender, what is the Catalpa? I'd never thought, like, what is that name? And she said, oh, you don't know the story. And she handed me the book. She says, it's here somewhere. And I started reading it. And I, it blew my mind. It still blows my mind. Mm-hmm. It's the greatest escape story never told. That's right. Well, we wish you well with it, Colin. It's been uh, Thank you very a pleasure much. speaking to you. And uh, normally, after I interview at Scribes at the Rock, uh, by the way, we had Pete Howell at Scribes at the Rock. You know Pete? You know the drinking Oh, life. I do. Yes, yes. Uh, he, so Still going follow, strong. Yeah, 84, 85. You're following in his footsteps. He, he did Scribes at the Rock for me. Uh, normally, after this uh, interview, I take you out for a meal. But unfortunately... Oh. That's going to have to wait. <laughs> you owe me a meal. <laughs> I owe you a meal. <laughs> okay, I'm well, going to hold you to that. To great talk. It, it's it, it's also well for me, you. Danny, uh, I've grown up, uh, you know, knowing you uh, and, and your role in Northern Ireland and, and politics and stuff. And uh, for me, it's a great honor uh, to talk to you in person. And uh, I just have to say that uh, this is one of those things where you know, I, I I did survive a life that's crazy. And sometimes I have little moments where I'm like, wow, I can't believe that I lived long enough to have this part also. And uh, it's a great honor just to be here chatting to you. Up Tyrone. Up Tyrone, Danny. Tyrone. <laughs> Tyrone <and Boo. laughs> Colin Broderick. God bless. Bye-bye.